Oil and gas is big business. The risks are high, and so are the rewards. Nowhere in life is this more true than on board an offshore drilling rig where the right discovery can change the future of individuals, communities, and even nations. But nothing good in life comes free. And what's the real, hidden price we pay for innovation? Despite happening over 40 years ago, the effects of the Ocean Ranger disaster are still felt deeply around the world today. The story has been the subject of books, plays, songs, and even movies. However, what's perhaps more tragic and less publicized than the events that occurred on the night of the incident itself is the broader context. The Ocean Ranger is the story of what happens when a brash, cutthroat drilling industry suddenly collides with an economically depressed community in rural Canada. The Ocean Ranger is the story of what happens when an unsinkable, man-made feat of engineering is finally put to the test by Mother Nature. The Ocean Ranger is the story of what happens when the television cameras leave and families are left alone to deal with a loss. In today's video, in addition to our standard, comprehensive technical breakdown of the sequence of events that occurred the night of the disaster, we'll also be examining this story through a different, more human lens. Although we sometimes forget it, people in team dynamics can be as much of, if not more of, an important factor in certain situations than even the underlying physics. By the end, we hope to understand the ins and outs of what actually happened that fateful night in the Atlantic Ocean, fill in the context of what and who brought us there in the first place, and highlight the very real risks taken on by normal people offshore every day that nobody thinks about until things go sideways. So without further ado, please enjoy a fresh take on the Ocean Ranger disaster in this second and final episode of our two-part documentary series. This is Unsinkable. The Ocean Ranger story, right here on Oilfield History. February 14th, 1982. It's Valentine's Day, but instead of spending it with their wives and girlfriends, the 84 man crew on board the Ocean Ranger is hard at work drilling for oil in the freezing waters 166 miles off the coast of Newfoundland in the Grand Banks region. The rig is on hire to Mobile Oil of Canada, MOCAN for short, and has been since they arrived on November 6, 1980. The crew is currently drilling their third exploration well of the job, J-34. At the time, the Ranger holds the coveted, unofficial title of being the largest semi-submersible drilling rig in the world. Owned by Ocean Drilling and Exploration Company, Otico for short, out of New Orleans, Louisiana, she's the crown jewel of a fleet that boasts several dozen drill ships and jackups operating around the globe. Simply put, the Ocean Ranger is a big deal, and Mocan has paid a pretty penny to hire her because the location where she's working, Hibernia Field, is also a big deal. The 1970s and early 1980s were a rough time in Newfoundland. Despite boasting plentiful natural resources, the province grappled with the highest unemployment rates in the country. Even before becoming an official Canadian province in 1949, the Newfoundland region and its people have always had a strong independence streak. They desired self-sovereignty and self-determination, but those dreams had been hampered by economic struggle compared to the rest of mainland Canada. The desire for Newfoundland to come of age and prove herself was bubbling under the surface when Chevron Corporation first struck oil offshore in Hibernia Field in 1979. For the first time in a long time, the discovery cracked open the door to a future where the people of Newfoundland could envision themselves taking their rightful seat at the table of a major international industry. Following the discovery at Hibernia, provincial and federal Canadian governments were off to the races, doing everything they could to encourage further exploration and development of offshore eastern Canada. Thanks to being brand new to the offshore industry though, they didn't have the necessary technical expertise available locally. Instead, they had to use tax breaks to incentivize more established American oilmen from New York, Houston, and New Orleans to bring their companies and drilling rigs to work in the region. To protect their interests, the Canadians also put in place strong local content requirements. The rigs and their management may have been American, but the labor force would be Canadian. That way, the Canadian people could slowly but surely learn the ropes of the offshore oil business and eventually be able to run it themselves. 
We see this arrangement reflected in the breakdown of the Ocean Ranger's crew on the night of the incident. Of the 84 men on board, 56 were from Newfoundland and 13 were from mainland Canada. A side note for those interested, after several major setbacks, one of which we're about to cover in depth here, Hibernia Field did eventually go on to fulfill her destiny as one of the great Canadian oil fields. Not only did she end up having double her originally estimated size with nearly 1.2 billion barrels of reserves, but she also set a world record when the over 600,000 metric ton Hibernia gravity-based structure was installed in 1999. The field has since gone on to extend her original design life and is expected to continue producing for many years to come. As part of the rush to continue exploring offshore Newfoundland, the Ocean Ranger is joined in Hibernia Field by the U.S. flagged Sedco 706 drilling rig 8 miles to her north. Another 11 miles further than that sits the Norwegian flag Zapata Ugland. All three are on hire at the Mokan and are actively drilling exploratory wells. Although they're geographically far apart, the drilling campaign of this magnitude requires significant coordination. Let's take a closer look at the organizational structure that Mocan and Otico have in place to achieve this. At this point in history, mobile offshore drilling rigs are still a bit of an odd duck. Because offshore oil and gas is a frontier industry, neither the American nor the Canadian government understand the underlying technology deeply enough to properly regulate it. For example, Fundamental questions such as whether offshore drilling should be treated as a primarily industrial activity taking place in a marine environment or a primarily marine operation that features industrial activity still abound. Where gaps exist, the government is currently filling them in with rules borrowed from the much older shipping industry and even looks to the oil companies themselves for guidance. This kind of ambiguity has left certain staffing and training requirements open to interpretation. As for-profit companies, Mokin and Otico have predictably stacked the deck heavily towards the drilling side of the equation rather than the marine operations side. At the end of the day, drilling's what pays the bills. The perception at the time is that marine operations are the simpler, commoditized part of the business. With a little instruction, any operator worth his salt can quickly learn to manage things like the ballast control system with minimal prior seafaring experience. Therefore, there's no need to maintain a large, expensive marine staff on board taking up precious bed space. This drilling-centric approach is reflected in the senior leadership structure on board each rig as well. That consists of three men, the Mocan Drilling Superintendent, the Otico Tool Pusher, and the Otico Master. You may recall this structure from our previous episode on the Ocean Express because it's identical to what Otico was using back then. The Mocan Drilling Superintendent is responsible for all Mocan staff and the well being drilled. His Otico counterpart, the Tool Pusher, is in charge of all Otico staff and safe operation of the vessel herself. Also reporting to the Tool Pusher is the Otico Vessel Master. Although the Master is a licensed captain with by far the most marine operations experience on board, unlike on a normal ship, he is not the ultimate decision making authority. Instead, he reports up to the Tool Pusher who has the power to overrule his decisions should he so choose. The offshore rig leadership teams all report up to their respective onshore managers. For Mobile, this is the Area Drilling Superintendent, Merv Graham. And for Otico, this is Drilling Superintendent, Jimmy Counts. Like any organization, in addition to the reporting lines that exist on paper, the individual people filling each role have a major influence on how things actually run. In no case is this more true than with Otico's Mr. Jimmy Counts. A southern man with a mean streak, Jimmy has been intimately involved with the Ocean Ranger since the start of her construction at Mitsubishi Heavy Industries in Japan back in 1976. He knows the rig like the back of his hand, better than anyone else on board. For all his technical expertise, though, Jimmy has a terrible reputation amongst the crew. He's universally known as being harsh, difficult to work with, and unwilling to compromise on just about anything. Regardless of what your religion is, if you're on his rig, Jimmy Counts is God, and if you don't believe that, you can go to hell.
Reporting directly up to Jimmy from onboard the Ocean Ranger is tool pusher Kent Thompson, a 36-year-old Mississippi native with 15 years drilling experience. He's held the role of tool pusher on the Ranger since January 1981. Prior to moving into the role, he worked as an assistant tool pusher under Jimmy. Despite their shared history, Kent and Jimmy have a terrible working relationship. Jimmy often makes visits out to the rig, sometimes seemingly for the express purpose of demonstrating to everyone, including Thompson, that he is the one calling all the shots. One day, a few months before the incident, an argument over the amount of water being used in the rig's laundry boils over with Jimmy and Thompson, and Thompson quits on the spot. After taking the next chopper flight into shore and just a couple days to cool off, though, the relationship seems to have been patched up as Thompson rejoins the rig and his crew once again. Also on board is a rotation of vessel masters. These men are greatly experienced sea captains by background, but are largely reduced to figureheads aboard the Ranger. Captain Carl Nearing has 40 years experience prior to joining the Ranger, with 20 of them coming as a Panama Canal pilot on large tankers. Despite his considerable knowledge and experience, Nearing regularly sees his judgment questioned and his authority undermined by the other Otico senior staff. For example, during a routine bunkering operation on New Year's Eve 1981, a frozen fuel line splits, causing hundreds of gallons of diesel to spill into the ocean. As is standard reporting procedure all over North America, Nearing orders the radio operator to call in the details of the spill to the Canadian government on shore. However, Jimmy Counts, who was also on board at the time, instead orders the radio operator to stand down. Appalled at the humiliation of being a vessel captain not allowed to control use of the radio, and thinking of the implications of what the situation would be like if something even more serious ever were to happen, Nearing resigns on the spot. After his resignation, Nearing is replaced by Baltimore's Captain Clarence House on January 26, 1982, just 19 days before the incident. Although House has been a vessel master for several years on different Otico rigs, as well as the 15 years prior for Bethlehem Steel Corporation, he's at a dark place in life when he joins up. Rotating crew members that were off-duty at the time of the accident would later recall him reeking of alcohol on the chopper flight out to his first hitch. It was clear to everyone involved that the Ocean Ranger's master was a token position rather than one with any legitimate authority. Drilling ran the show. The Ocean Ranger herself is a sight to behold. She's the longest, the widest, and the tallest rig in field, with a displacement of nearly 45,000 tons. For comparison, Zapata Uglin, which is also considered a large drilling rig, displaces 30,000 tons. The Ranger measures 396 feet long by 262 feet wide. That's 121 meters long by 80 meters wide for our friends out there who prefer using the metric system. She's made up of eight vertical columns connected to two long pontoons running along her port and starboard sides. A series of additional truss and brace members, as well as two deck levels, support a large accommodation, a helideck, three rig cranes, and all cargo required for drilling. She's commonly referred to by management, especially Jimmy, as unsinkable, and she certainly looks the part. The Ocean Ranger's sheer size contributes to the perception that she's invincible, and the more people say it, the more everyone seems to believe it. And yet, despite all the big talk amongst managers and back on shore in the Newfoundland community, crewmen who are closest to the Ranger view her in a much different light. In fact, they refer to her as the Ocean Danger. While the rig herself may be state-of-the-art, the green crew manning her certainly still has some learning to do. As is common on many drilling rigs around this time in history, there are frequent instances of men getting hands caught and losing fingers or breaking arms while working on the rig floor. The equipment's heavy, the operators are inexperienced, and everyone is in a mad rush to get things up and running so they can start pumping oil out of the ground and making money as soon as possible. Local content requirements mean that the crew training is minimal. It's not uncommon to see a man that just hired on with zero experience suddenly on the rig floor tripping in pipe a few weeks later. This style of fast promotion and minimal training is also prevalent on the vessel's marine team. 
The Ocean Ranger has a small marine department on board consisting of two ballast control officers, commonly referred to as BCOs, and the vessel master. The two BCOs work opposite one another on 12-hour shifts with the vessel master filling in for them for meals and routine inspection duties inside the hull. The two BCOs on tower at the time of the incident are Donald Rathburn and Dominic Dyke, 30 and 29 years old, respectively. Both hired on with Otico less than two years ago as roustabouts before subsequently transitioning over to their current roles. Neither man has any formal training from Otico on ballast control system operation. Everything they know has been gained through on-the-job training, private study, and informal mentoring from the masters. In fact, per Otico's own published training standards now being shown on screen, Dominic Dyke has just 40 of the 80 weeks on board required to hold the position of entry ballast control officer, while Don Rathburn has less than 20. The Ocean Ranger's ballast control system itself is also notoriously not user-friendly. Each valve actuator down in the hull is controlled by a corresponding button on a switchboard located in the ballast control room. Although the physical system itself functions reliably, the skill level in operating it varies widely amongst the marine team and leads to a troubling pattern of ballasting mistakes. A former Ranger senior BCO captured it best during his official witness testimony at court hearings after the incident when he said, quote, During probably the first year I was on board, somebody dropped a bunch of drill water from the drill water day tank to starboard five. I recall that being about five degrees before we got it back. A couple of other times, somebody opened a valve the wrong way and got about four or five degrees on it. End quote. Unexpected listing events are shockingly commonplace for the Ranger. No one not even the vessel masters, is immune because no one has the proper training or a complete understanding of how the full system actually works. For example, just two weeks before the incident, Captain Nearing's replacement, Captain House, famously pushes the wrong button on the control panel and quickly puts a six-degree list on the vessel. The lean is so sudden and severe that the entire crew musters to lifeboat stations. Nearing is publicly reprimanded by tool pusher Kent Thompson following the incident. Thompson mandates that House, the vessel master, no longer be allowed to touch any of the ballast controls, despite that being his main job, while on board. As alluded to previously, House is by no means alone, as Nearing had a similar slip-up prior to his resignation, as had three or four other vessel captains that spent time on board the Ranger. It can't be stressed enough that random, unexpected listing events are not normal or acceptable on any kind of seagoing vessel let alone a drilling rig. At the time of our story, there's already clearly a glaring skill gap on board the Ocean Ranger that's being allowed to linger instead of being properly addressed and rooted out. As mentioned, on occasion, unexpected listing events like the one caused by Captain House are severe enough for someone to sound the vessel alarm and the crew members to muster to their lifeboats in preparation for evacuation. However, there are glaring issues with the lifeboats as well. When the Ocean Ranger transitioned from being a Panamanian flag vessel to an American flag vessel back in 1980, the U.S. Coast Guard performed an inspection and stated that Otico was to replace her current lifeboats with Coast Guard-approved models prior to their next inspection in December 1981. However, Otico has been slow to implement these changes. At present, one of the replacement boats is still sitting in its cradle on deck awaiting installation. Even if it were installed and ready to use, Crew training on how to operate the boats is minimal at best. When mustering to lifeboat stations, it's common for the crew to nonchalantly show up in street clothes, pajamas, and other types of clothing not suited for the frozen environment of offshore Newfoundland. The rig's supposed to be unsinkable after all, so why should anyone take drills seriously? Once previously, a crew member remarked to Kent Thompson about the sorry state of the life jackets and lack of cold water survival suits on board, to which Kent replied that, quote, if you're not satisfied with the condition of the equipment, there are 16,000 other guys waiting to take your job back on shore. End quote. It's true. Newfoundland still has a depressed economy at the time, and there's an abundance of young men chomping at the bit to break their way into a high-paying oil field job, even if the conditions are a little dangerous. Perhaps most dangerous of all, though, are the interpersonal dynamics on board the rig. As mentioned previously, the atmosphere on board the Ocean Ranger is contentious from the get-go. Otico is an American drilling company out of South Louisiana with an American crew. Thanks to Canada's local content requirements, though, 
many American friends and co-workers have now been replaced by the inexperienced Newfie hands. The stressors of budget pressure, schedule pressure, and performing a hard job in a harsh environment quickly cause tensions to rise and tempers flare frequently. By many accounts, differential treatment bordering on discrimination is commonplace. To capture the mood in a single story, one day, legend has it that two crewmen from Newfoundland, who happen to be brothers, take particular offense to Jimmy Counts running one of them off the rig floor for some minor infraction. The brothers both burst into Jimmy's bunk later that night and beat the hell out of him in retaliation. After disappearing for about a week or so, though, Jimmy's back on board again. When the same two men later return to the Ranger on a supply ship, they're ready to be transferred over to the rig via the man basket attached to one of the rig's cranes to start their hitch. However, instead of completing the personnel transfer like normal, Jimmy orders the crane operator to hold the brothers suspended high over the water for a couple hours instead. In the middle of winter, off the coast of Newfoundland, wearing nothing but the thin flannels they came in with, this is a particularly cruel punishment. But such is life for the men on board the ocean danger. February 14th, 1982, 0730 hours. It's Sunday morning and routine drilling operations are well underway on each of the three rigs in Hibernia Field when Mocan's third-party weather service, Nordco Limited, issues an updated warning for a brewing storm they've been tracking for the past several days. The drill sites are now expected to see maximum winds of 90 knots and 35-foot high waves by evening. This kind of severe weather, although concerning, is nothing that the rigs aren't accustomed to. Since she first started working six years ago in 1976, the Ocean Ranger has kept a running log on board that shows she's ridden out more than 50 major storms while drilling at various locations, including Alaska, the U.S. East Coast, and Ireland. The crew knows that they just need to continue monitoring the situation, and if conditions do in fact keep getting worse, take the precautionary measure of standing by or fully suspending drilling operations. February 14, 1982 1100 hours. Around late morning, Kent Thompson calls Jimmy Counts for the second time today back at Otico headquarters in St. John's. Kent informs Jimmy that the Ranger is still drilling ahead and that they plan to continue operations as normal unless conditions worsen. Jimmy agrees with the plan. He then tells Kent that he'll be leaving the Otico office shortly to return home due to the increasingly bad, snowstorm-like conditions that are developing in St. John's back on shore. If Kent or the Ranger needs further support, they can contact Jimmy there via the rig's Marsat radio system, as always. Listen now to several individuals who were present in St. John's that very evening describe the conditions they were experiencing. My wife and I walked down to my sister's house for a game of cards that night. And we were both, uh, like many other people, of course, looking at the storm. And I do recall saying, you know, that I feel sorry for anybody who's at sea tonight because it must have been a nightmarish night at sea. I remember it was a vicious night. And I thought about it uh, that night, and I said, well, I hope that storm is not out there. I was doing the ice and the weather, and, uh, I mean, we were looking at the forecast. I mean, it was certainly cold, but calling for, you know, an enormously strong, you know, blow. It turned out to be just horrific. I mean, it was just such a massive storm. I spoke to the radio operator who was coming on nights, on the ranger. And he told me how he went in with, and sat down with the weatherman that evening, and uh, he was looking at the anemometer, and he said she went up to 115 knots before she started backing off, you know. So they had it a bit worse than what we did. It was an awful storm that night, and in fact, it shook the building. So I woke up at that point, 
at about 2 o'clock in the morning. And I thought to myself, I said, where the hell would I be now if I was out on the oil rig? And I immediately answered the question. I said, I'd be hovelled behind some kind of a windbreak wishing to God I wasn't there. February 14th, 1982, 1200 hours. The weather does indeed continue to worsen as morning gives way to early afternoon. The Zapata Uglin is the first to throw in the towel on drilling ops. Although we're not drillers, we'll cover the quick and dirty version of the basics here for context. Drilling wells offshore is, generally speaking, very similar to drilling wells onshore. However, one major difference is that offshore, you must also account for the global motions of the vessel you're drilling from as she pitches, rolls, and heaves in the wind and waves. If the environment you're drilling in threatens to move your rig too far off your target location, that's a problem because you may damage your equipment or worse. Rigs that are larger and more stable enjoy increased drilling operational efficiency and larger working windows because they're more easily able to maintain station in a wider variety of environmental conditions. In the case of the Zapata Uglin, the weather is now deemed to exceed her operating criteria. She shears her drill pipe, hangs off in the lower ram of her blowout preventer, or BOP, on the seafloor, and comes back out of the hole. Sedco 706 follows suit shortly after, and she's able to hang off and come out of the hole without having to shear her drill pipe. Shearing drill pipe is an alternative means of disconnecting from a well bore in which the drill pipe is literally cut in two by massive hydraulic rams located inside the blowout preventer on seafloor. This is done when circumstances such as time or issues with the drill string itself don't allow for the pipe to be pulled up and disassembled piece by piece as is normally the case. Shearing off isn't ideal because of the additional cost and time associated with restarting operations. However, sometimes it's necessary. It should be noted that the crew on board the Zapata Uglin testified that, on the day in question, they did in fact receive Nordco Limited's weather forecast with ample time to disassemble their drill string normally without having to shear off. However, they chose to shear due to a pre existing problem they were experiencing with their drill string, not sudden unexpected onset of weather. February 14th, 1982, 1545 hours. With the two other rigs in field now disconnected from their respective well bores, the Ocean Ranger is reportedly still drilling ahead at a rate of 18 feet per hour. Being able to go longer and harder than everyone else has historically been a point of pride on the Ranger. In fact, only once before in her six-year history has she been forced to fully disconnect due to a storm. One can speculate this impressive track record, her massive size, and general air of invincibility influenced the ranger and her crew as they decide to forge ahead despite clearly worsening circumstances. Eventually, though, even the ranger is forced to admit defeat as the weather is simply getting too bad. When she finally does start the disconnection process in the late afternoon, she runs into several delays with her hoses fouling up in the side of the derrick due to the extreme winds. This forces the ranger to shear her drill string off to disconnect from the wellbore more quickly. Waves are now so high that they've begun spraying up and soaking the rig floor, making it dangerously slick. It's been a hairy afternoon at Hibernia. However, by 1845 hours, all three rigs are safely decoupled from their wells on the seafloor and hurriedly finishing last-minute preparations for riding out the storm raging around them. It's at this point that the ranger makes another tactical error. Standard practice for mobile offshore drilling units dictates that, during extreme weather, vessel draft is to be raised from operating draft to survival draft. Raising vessel draft increases the distance between the waterline and the vessel's non-watertight areas, a dimension more commonly referred to as freeboard. Maintaining adequate freeboard during storms is critical because it's a direct measure of the reserve buoyancy that a vessel has to work with in the event of damage to any of her watertight compartments or other unexpected listing or flooding conditions. More freeboard also means that you have greater capacity to counter flood compartments opposite the location of any damage to mitigate vessel inclination. And finally, increased freeboard also decreases the risk of wave slamming damage by moving critical structures further out of reach. Despite all of this, for reasons that will never truly be known, as the storm hits the Ocean Ranger, she chooses to remain at her maximum allowable operating draft of 80 feet 
24.4 meters, instead of deballasting to our survival draft. February 14, 1982, 2000 hours. With the storm now in full swing, a particularly large rogue wave reportedly crashes over the Sedco 706. The wave is so large that it soaks the main deck, dislodges a small shed that had previously been welded to the rig floor, and even damages several secondary steel beams that are part of the main deck framing. The damage is effectively cosmetic and the rig is fine, but the event has the crew shaken and underscores the seriousness of the situation. Furthermore, this presumably same 70 to 80 foot rogue wave has also smashed into both the Zapata Ugland and the Ocean Ranger. The Zapata Ugland sustains no damage, but Ocean Ranger is not so lucky. As mentioned previously, the Ranger's made up of eight columns sitting on two pontoons that run north-south. Since the crew has elected, or perhaps been forced, to remain at their maximum 80-foot operating draft, this puts the rig's ballast control room just 28 feet or 8.5 meters above the waterline in the third column on the starboard side. In addition to the ballast control panel and tank level gauges, the room also contains several other critical items such as the electronics cabinets for the gas detection system and the PA system. There are also four small port lights, which are circular windows that the BCOs look out of to observe the vessel's draft and the conditions outside. Notably absent, despite the technology being available at the time, is a digital means of measuring draft or any secondary means of draft measurement. Essentially, this means that if the Ranger BCOs want to know how low their rig is sitting in the water, they must open the port lights in the ballast control room so they can look out each window, observe the physical draft marks painted onto the side of each column, physically record those draft readings, then calculate the average. Despite being designed to withstand pressure from wave forces, glass windows in a giant steel column are still obvious weak points. As a means of reinforcement, each port light is outfitted with steel deadlight cover, which can be closed and secured in place in the event that a particularly large wave is anticipated. Unfortunately for the Ranger, and again for reasons that we'll probably never truly know, none of these deadlight covers are in place when the massive rogue wave that damaged the Sedco 706 also slams into Ocean Ranger. Port light number four is immediately shattered, and seawater splashes over the control panel causing it to short circuit. The lights on the panel that indicate whether a given ballast control valve is open or closed are now randomly blinking, dimming, or have, even more confusingly, shut off completely. The BCOs begin to panic, at first assuming that the very valves that keep their lower hold tanks from taking on water directly from the open ocean may now be opening and closing uncontrollably thanks to the panel short circuiting. In reality, the ballast control panel has short circuited but no valves are randomly opening and closing on their own just yet. The BCOs are able to work with one of the rig electricians to pull power to the panel itself relatively quickly, which causes all ballast valves to fail closed automatically per design. The vessel does not take any immediate list, and so for now, the situation appears to be under control. The behavior of both operators and managers on board the Ranger in the hour or so following the initial damage to port light number four is consistent with this theory. Relatively little radio communication goes on between the rig and shore during this time. In the conversations that do occur, there's barely any mention of the port light situation, much less severe, sudden listing, or anything that constitutes an emergency. February 14th, 1982, 2100 hours. The radio room operator on the Ranger now makes contact with the bridge crew on her support vessel, the Seaforth Highlander. Each drilling rig in the field has a support ship assigned to her to help deliver supplies, ferry crew members back and forth, and be available for support in the event of an emergency. The Highlander is assigned to the Ocean Ranger, the Bolton Tor is assigned to Sedco 706, and the Norder Tor is assigned to Zapata Ugland. Despite what we as viewers now know are increasingly dangerous circumstances building on board the Ranger, at the time the radio communication occurs, still no request is made of the Highlander to come in closer for potential rescue support. Instead, the Ranger radio man simply inquires as to the Highlander's whereabouts, learning that she's nearly seven miles away 
grappling with their own challenges of weathering the storm that they both find themselves caught in. February 14th, 1982, 2200 hours. Mobile drilling foreman Jack Jacobson calls his supervisor, Merv Graham, back on shore, giving him a general update on the events of the evening, including the hanging off, the shearing of the drill pipe, and eventually the broken control room port light too. Surprisingly though, Jacobson's demeanor is casual, saying that their situation is under control, the ballast control system is functioning normally, and that there's no cause for concern. After hanging up with Graham, he repeats this message on phone calls with the mobile reps on board the other two rigs. Then, all goes quiet as midnight passes by, seemingly uneventfully. All indications from the information available to describe what was going on on board Ocean Ranger during these few hours following the initial breaking of port light number 4 are that A. The rig is not yet experiencing any sudden, unexplained listing problems. B. The crew views the port light situation as something non-critical that will be resolved shortly, which is why they either neglect to mention it or describe it nonchalantly during the radio conversations, and C. That they are not in any inordinate amount of danger. This is just another big storm that they're in the midst of waiting out. February 15th, 1982, 0100 hours. Now things finally start to come unglued, suddenly, quickly, and violently. Jack Jacobson attempts to call Merv Graham directly at his house via a phone patch, but it fails due to the poor weather conditions. Sensing concern in Jack's voice, the operator is eventually able to connect the two via the Marsat system. Here are some excerpts from that very conversation. Search and rescue man. Sir, mobile radio calling? Yeah. Got an emergency on the Ocean Ranger? Yeah. Just a second. Ocean Ranger, uh, Jack, are you there? Uh, Roger. Can you give us anything else on it right now? I am, um, we're listening badly and we uh, need to get the people off the rig and get the bodies. Uh, we may not be able to, be able to hold a rig, uh, rig late from all over. Roger, Jack, could you get us the wind direction, please? The wind direction, over. West, and it's 70 or 70 to 80. Roger, how many boats have you got on location right now, over? Uh, three boats total. As we can clearly hear, at this point, the Ranger now all of a sudden has significant problems. Jacobson informs Graham that the Ranger is listing significantly towards her bow. Crew is not sure what the cause is, they're still working to isolate the issue. Graham and the team on shore alert the Coast Guard, their contract helicopters, and the support vessels in the area, telling everyone to mobilize to the Ranger's position immediately and stand by to provide assistance. February 15th, 1982. 0105 hours. Five minutes after the conversation with Graham, the ranger herself makes radio contact again with Seaforth Highlander. This time they request that she come in close to standby position. Unfortunately, there was no similar request made of the Highlander when they spoke earlier in the evening, so she's still seven miles away and as a much smaller vessel, is about to have a hell of a time steaming through large, heavy seas to even make it to the ranger's position, let alone be ready to render aid. It's at the same time that Ranger also first informs Highlander that she's listing badly and all countermeasures to regain even keel are proving ineffective. February 15, 1982, 0109 hours. The first official distress call goes out from the Ranger. It's a somewhat garbled telex message to the Coast Guard Regional Command Center located in New York, indicating that it's being typed out very hastily. We have that message fully transcribed, word for word, typos and all, on screen. We'll put it up for a few seconds so you have a chance to read it. February 15th, 1982, 0110 hours. Ranger radio man Ken Blackmore contacts Mobile Shore Base and asks them to begin transmitting a mayday signal on their behalf, implying that the Ranger may shortly no longer be able to do so herself. February 15th, 1982, 0111 hours. Jack Jacobson phones his mobile counterpart on the Sedco 706 and requests that they begin transmitting the same Mayday signal for the Ocean Ranger. By this time, both the Sedco 706 and the Zapata Uglin 
have dispatched their own supply ships to the ranger's position. However, they're still 15 and 20 miles out respectively, and, just like the Highlander, will have to fight their way through massive waves and gale force winds before they can even get there. In a matter of less than half an hour since the first distress call was made, everyone in Hibernia Field is now aware that there's a massive problem on board the Ranger and that things are not looking good. As they scramble to organize rescue resources and get them en route, Ranger radio operator Ken Blackmore's voice crackles to life over the radio once more at 0130 hours. He informs Mobile Shore Base that the Ranger's crew are now abandoning their posts and heading for lifeboats. February 15th, 1982, 0130 hours. The crew is going to lifeboat stations to evacuate half an hour after the first request for assistance is made. There are four lifeboats on board at the time. One is sitting uselessly idle on deck waiting to be installed. Another, located at the bow, is completely smashed or otherwise impossible to use due to its position and the vessel's extreme forward list. The two remaining functional lifeboats are all that's left and are both located at vessel stern. As we touched on before, due to the ongoing and notably past due upgrades required by the U.S. Coast Guard after the vessel reflagged, one of these lifeboats is the original Harding type on the port side. The other is the new Coast Guard compliant American watercraft type on the starboard side. We know with certainty that the Harding boat was successfully launched with 30 or more men inside although likely not without great difficulty. It remains unclear whether the watercraft boat was ever successfully launched and, if she was, whether there was anyone inside. Regardless, due to the extreme angle of the vessel made worse by the dynamic pitching and rolling motions caused by large waves, we can safely assume that any lifeboat launched from the stern side was almost certainly being violently smashed into the side of the rig on its way down, potentially causing injury to the crew and significant damage to the boats themselves. This is corroborated by the observations of the state of the lifeboats made by personnel on board support vessels during the rescues later. To elaborate a bit, the lifeboats were in this initial predicament during launch due to the extreme vessel list. All lifeboats on seagoing vessels are designed to be launched safely under conditions up to a certain, somewhat reasonable, angle of vessel inclination as shown by the diagram that corresponds to the Ranger lifeboats that you see on screen now. However, under more extreme conditions and even more extreme inclinations, geometry dictates that you're going to be running the risk of contact between lifeboats, the column side shells, and any cross brace members connecting them. Suffice to say that it would have been a wild ride from the main deck down to the waterline for the few men huddled together inside the Harding boat. But despite all the circumstances stacked against them, they were able to successfully launch and begin motoring away from the soon-to-be wreckage of the Ocean Ranger out into the dark, stormy seas. The three rig support vessels that were dispatched earlier are now beginning to arrive in field. They are, for all intents and purposes, first responders at this point instead of supply ships. They're also likely to be the best hope that any Ranger crewman has of surviving given the compromised condition of their lifeboats and the fact that their former rig now appears increasingly poised to sink directly behind them. February 15, 1982, 0211 hours. First to arrive on scene is Captain Ronald Duncan and Seaforth Highlander. While en route, the crew have scrounged up whatever meager rescue supplies they can find on board, consisting of a cargo net, a few boat hooks, and several thin heaving lines that they've tied monkey fist knots into the ends of. Approaching from the south of the ranger's position, Captain Duncan sights a cluster of white lights from the ranger's deck as well as several smoke flares off the rig's port beam side. As he gets closer, he also notices several empty life preservers floating in the water nearby. When another distress flare pops off near the rig's starboard quarter at approximately 0214 hours though, the Highlander redirects and gives chase. Highlander quickly locates the lifeboat that the flare came from. She's motoring away from the scene under her own power but is clearly in dire straits with large holes visibly ripped into both of her sides. Captain Duncan maneuvers the Highlander to the lifeboat's downwind side with great difficulty, putting her stern into the seas to avoid ramming the limping vessel and damaging her any further. He dispatches his crew to the back deck to prepare for rescue operations. 
February 15, 1982, 0234 hours. The ailing lifeboat is so close now that the Highlander crew can see the men inside frantically bailing out the water entering through the gaping holes in their hull, presumably due to contact with the side of the Ranger during launch, as we mentioned previously. A life preserver with a line attached is thrown from the Highlander to the lifeboat, where it's caught by a man leading out of the aft boarding door and affixed to their handrail. A second line is secured in a similar manner towards the bow. Shortly after the second line is secured, eight men aboard the lifeboat exit through the port side doors and assemble on the port side of the craft, undoubtedly very eager to transfer over to the safety of the Highlander. The men are wearing clothing varying from pajamas to coveralls, reinforcing the idea that they were forced to abandon ship quickly and unexpectedly with different amounts of time for each man's preparation. Tragically, when these eight men congregate on the port side of the lifeboat, the weight causes it to begin slowly rolling to port until they all lose their footing, the two securing lines break, and each man is cast into the sea as the boat capsizes. Immediately, the crew of the Highlander is scrambling to deploy their life raft and use other means to recover the drowning, now undoubtedly near hypothermic men that are in the water. Unfortunately, the cold quickly compromises the ability of the men that were previously in the lifeboat to assist in their own rescue. They're simply too cold to function, and the Highlander crew tragically watches as they're unable to grab life preservers, swim towards the now deployed life raft, or otherwise help themselves. In the end, Despite the heroic efforts of Captain Duncan and his crew, not a single man is able to be rescued alive. Listen now to the captain and crew of the Highlander describe their experience during the attempted rescue in their own words. Well, I say that the closest I see that life but was only feet away. And, well, they start coming out of the lifeboat. As they start coming out, I counted uh, seven maybe eight, mm -hmm. and I was holding on to the handrail. And the boat you started leaning and continue, and I capsized. And it uh, appeared to me that as soon as them men struck the water, they let go. You can hear the guys scream for help and things, I guess. They were pretty rough on us. And trying to get boat hooks out to them, get a hook into a bit of clothing or something, cause just, but they just couldn't get them. When you reach out and you're just about to get them, you'll have to drop the hook or hold on to the hook and grab a hold of something and hold on for a second, because the wave will come take you. The lifeboat was damaged. There was a large hole in the bow of her, and she was cracked down the bottom. There was a crack in the bottom of her. At the third attempt, we got a line on her. Uh, she uh, came up. When, it, uh, when the ship was even, she came up to a rail. It was a good view. You could see right down through the boat. There were several bodies there, uh, strapped in by these seat belts they have in the boat. I would say rough number, maybe 20. The weather was extremely severe. We had uh, snow, freezing spray, water coming over the deck. I guess we can be lucky that we wasn't among them too. February 15th, 1982, 0245 hours. Next to arrive on scene is Captain James Davison and the Bolton Tour. Over an hour has passed since the abandoned ship order was given though, and so the Ranger herself's condition is now decidedly worse. Fewer lights are visible on deck as the Bolton Tour surveys the scene, not finding any signs of life or remaining lifeboats in the immediate vicinity. At 0255 hours, the Bolton Tour receives a radio request from the Seaforth Highlander for assistance in the ongoing rescue attempt to recover the men in the water from the capsized Harding boat. And so, she proceeds in that direction. February 15th, 1982, 0300 hours. Meanwhile, the Zapata Uglin support vessel, Norder Tour, which was furthest away when the distress call was received, is continuing to speed toward the Ranger's position, all while tracking her on the radar. Around 0300 hours, Captain Baxter Allingham notes that the rig has disappeared from their screen. Shortly thereafter, two new blips, presumably the pontoons of the capsized rig, appear in the same location before disappearing altogether by 0338 hours. It's therefore assumed that Ocean Ranger officially capsized around this time. 
Helicopters were also scrambled as part of the rescue effort, although their takeoffs are initially delayed by the incredibly dangerous storm conditions gripping onshore Newfoundland as well as Hibernia Field. When they finally do arrive on site, their effectiveness is severely limited due to the incredibly elevated wind conditions and sea spray from large crashing waves. Pilots would later describe the need to hot refuel on board Sedco 706 and Zapata Uglin because they couldn't risk turning off their engines for fear of being blown off the helideck. The heroic efforts of everyone from the pilots down to the rig crews that were literally crawling out to the choppers with fuel lines to avoid being blown off in the wind were also remarkable to read about and deserve to be noted and commended. It's my very, very sad duty to, to tell you officially the Ocean Ranger is lost. There were 84 people aboard, and at this point in time, we, we certainly cannot hold out much hope for survivors. On behalf of all of the employees of Mobile, I'd like to express my, my very deepest sympathy to the wives and families of these men who are on board. These people certainly have our prayers at the present time. What you just listened to is recorded audio of one of the first announcements that Mocan made to the public after learning what had happened to the Ocean Ranger. Predictably, there was a lot of chaos, questions, conflicting information, and general confusion in the aftermath of the disaster. In the days that followed the capsizing event, a total of 22 bodies were recovered from the 84-man crew before the recovery effort was called off on Friday, February 19th. By that time, the Newfoundland community was well into the depths of grief and shock as news reporters from around the province, country, and world descended on St. John's where the Mobile and Otico offices were located. There were strong, angry accusations that the oil companies were trying to smooth things over by hiding or not reporting certain unflattering details of the situation as quickly as they appeared. It's interesting and difficult to note that a good portion of the Otico and Mobile employees working in the St. John's offices were native Newfoundlanders themselves. They were members of the community who had also taken advantage of the opportunity to go work in the oil field when it came to Newfoundland in an attempt to better their lives and the lives of their families. Many of these people were friends with those affected by the tragedy and in some cases were even directly connected to the husbands, sons, and brothers that had been killed. As one can imagine, this put them in a very challenging position while dealing with the aftershock, disbelief, anger, and sorrow that came after the disaster. As can be observed from the literature, the Ocean Ranger was truly an event that affected the entire province and shook everyone to their core. News camera footage showing body bags being unloaded at the dock for the families to begin identifying is just truly heartbreaking stuff. No other way to put it. While the societal and emotional impacts of the disaster are one aspect that needs to be dealt with, we also have an obligation to dig through the nuts and bolts of what happened. What are the technical root causes behind why the Ocean Ranger capsized? There were multiple investigations conducted by multiple government agencies from multiple countries after the incident, namely Canada and the United States given where the vessel was flagged. Computer simulations were run, scale model testing was performed, Divers were dispatched to recover evidence from the wreck, and hundreds of hours of in-person interviews were conducted. First and foremost, the ranger got off on a bad foot when she chose to continue drilling despite the clear forecast of increasingly severe weather issued by Nordco Limited for the afternoon and evening of February 14th. We see this reflected in the difficulty that the ranger had coming out of the hole when her hoses fouled up in the derrick and she was forced to shear off her drill strength. Neither Zapata Uglin nor Sedco 706 had to disconnect with the same level of haste, because the time pressure was essentially self-imposed by the ranger when she chose to keep working. The next key mistake came when the ranger failed to deballast from her 80-foot maximum operating draft to her survival draft before the storm overtook her. As explained earlier, decreasing draft increases freeboard, and therefore reduces the risk of wave damage to critical structures such as a ballast control room that happens to be located just 28 feet off the waterline. 
whether she ran out of time for this operation due to the time pressure imposed by her decision to keep drilling late into the afternoon, or fell victim to her own self-perception of invincibility. In either case, the crew's decision to not deballast put their Achilles heel of a ballast control room unnecessarily at greater risk. The next link in the chain is the infamous broken port light number four. Lab testing later revealed that its manufactured glass thickness was below the dimension called for in design drawings. There was also predictably further wall loss due to the corrosive nature of the saltwater environment meaning that the hydrodynamic force generated by the rogue wave was more than enough to cave it in and flood the control room with seawater. Once water ingress to the ballast control room occurred, the control panel was significantly damaged. Initial short-circuiting would have likely caused the flashing or dimming of the lights used to indicate valve open or closed position. This is consistent with VHF radio traffic overheard by other vessels at the time. We overheard uh, conversations... Uh that uh, they were mopping up water and cleaning up broken glass. Their PA system was knocked out. Their gas detection system was knocked out. And they wanted the ET man, electronic technician, to come down to the control room. And at some point along there, they said valve or valves were opening and closing on their own. Despite the initial panic reactions caused by the malfunctioning ballast control panel display, in reality, Valves randomly opening and closing by themselves was not the case yet. The indicator lights were just on the fritz, and no unexpected listing is documented to have occurred until several hours later that night, after a sequence of other fateful decisions that we're about to analyze in depth. The crew got an electrician to remove power from the board, fix the deadlight covers over each of the room port lights to prevent further water ingress, and cleaned up the mess, all while Kent Thompson and other managers reported to shore that all was well and the system was functioning normally. The Ocean Ranger was in a compromised state at this point, but she was not yet doomed. That changed when she reconnected the power supply to the control panel. The exact reason why the crew chose to reconnect the panel to power during the middle of the storm instead of holding the stable position that they had already achieved remains unclear to this day. Perhaps they wanted to assess the condition of the damaged lights, or even attempt to deballast to survival draft to prevent further wave damage. However, the effect of putting the board back on a different circuit and resupplying power to it between 030 and 045 hours introduced new shorts to the valve microswitches that it now had the opportunity to soak and fill with water as the seawater was covering the board while it was being cleaned up. These new shorts actually did begin forcing the sudden, unplanned opening of several valves and, consequently, the reported sudden, unplanned 8-degree list to the port bow side. Due to the direction of the list, it's most likely that sea chest valve number 32 that led directly to the open ocean and manifold valve number 20 were compromised, creating a path for seawater to flow freely into any of the other 12 port side ballast tanks that had the potential be open. By the time the BCOs realized the effect of their action after a minute or so and yanked the power again to cause all valves to automatically fail close, the vessel would have been in significant trouble, but still not dead to rights. It was around this time, at 0100 hours, that Kent Thompson informed Merv Graham of the issue and that the team was working to isolate the problem. Tragically, from that point in the night onward, the crew's lack of understanding of how the ballast system worked likely sealed their fates. With the sudden list, everyone would have been in a natural panic rush to take corrective action. The most obvious next step would have been to send someone down into the hole to manually shut the sea chest valves to guarantee that no further water ingress from the ocean could occur. Once this action was complete, the crew likely would have believed that they had isolated the issue and could begin correcting the list by powering the board back on, using it to start up their ballast pumps, and discharging the excess water they'd taken on overboard. However, as soon as they powered the board back on a third time, they would have unwittingly reintroduced the problem of the valve microswitch shorting once again, which would have resumed causing more internal valves to open and close randomly without their knowledge. Some portion of the now open internal valves would have then allowed water to gravitate from the aft to fore tanks thanks to the forward list. Even though the crew was likely heartened when they saw the pumps kick on and got them running full speed, 
This hope would have quickly turned to dismay, confusion, and fear as the forward list inexplicably continued to increase. In addition to the negative effect of having water gravitating from the aft to fore tanks, having aft tank valves randomly opened up also meant that because they were in the closest proximity to the ballast pumps in the aft pump rooms, water was being sucked out of the aft tanks first, not the critically flooded forward tanks. Removing water from the aft tanks would have had the opposite of the intended effect, causing the rig to list to the bow even faster. That's correct. The attempts being made to pump water out of the Ranger were likely dooming her even faster. In what would have undoubtedly been a panicked, grasping at straws attempt to correct the increasing bow list despite their best pumping efforts, evidence shows that the crew tried to frantically insert brass rods into several valve controls on the panel. These rods had been used during commissioning back in Japan and were effectively a way to manually override the system's electrical switching system. Unfortunately, the crew appears to have incorrectly believed that these brass rods could be used to force valves close when the post-incident investigation report confirmed that in reality, inserting them opened the corresponding valves. Thus, they would have continued making the problem worse with this attempt. As the situation in the control room became increasingly untenable and none of their last-ditch efforts appeared to be working, the crew may have even suspected that they'd sustained damage to their hull and that some of their tanks were structurally compromised. As they were boarding lifeboats and attempting to evacuate the facility in a panic, the list would have continued to increase. Once it reached the 10 to 15 degree mark, down flooding, which we covered previously in the BP Thunder Horse and Secor Power videos, would have begun in the enormous open top mooring chain lockers. As is usually the case, the down flooding phenomenon would have compounded the bow list issue likely introducing even more unwanted seawater into the deck box and columns through open vent lines and putting the final nail in the coffin for the ranger. Many problems are avoided or created during the design phase of a project. Here are several key things we can notice about the Ocean Ranger's design. To start, open chain lockers on semis are a massive downflooding risk. They were the straw that broke the camel's back in the ranger situation. Not only were her chain lockers designed like open top buckets, completely exposed to the environment, but they also didn't have any level indicators or pre existing means of pumping them out should water ingress occur. On modern rigs, it's common to see custom fit coverings protecting chain locker openings to prevent similar situations. The lockers themselves also come with level gauges and are connected to the platform bilge. Furthermore, the ballast system itself had several liabilities that gave an otherwise perfectly robust rig some unnecessary Achilles heels. The most obvious example is the location of the ballast control room. Having spaces normally occupied by humans unnecessarily located in the splash zone is a poor design choice that had fatal consequences for the Ocean Ranger. When rigs are designed, if we have the opportunity to engineer out potential risks, we can buy ourselves more margin for error. For example, it's common practice to put a rig's flare boom on the opposite side of the platform from the living quarters. If you have the opportunity to move something dangerous away from something vulnerable, you typically take it. In the ranger's case, if the ballast control room had been located well away from the waterline, that design choice would have meant that the marine team likely wouldn't have had to fumble their way through dealing with a short-circuited ballast control panel, giving them unclear indications of what the state of their system was. Imagine trying to read a multi-hundred page user manual while the rig you're on is rapidly sinking around you and you don't know why. That is not a recipe for success, and we should use engineering design choices to eliminate on-the-fly troubleshooting like this whenever possible. One more smaller but still important point on the ballast system would also be the location chosen for the ballast pumps. Keeping all of this equipment at the aft end made for fine enough operations when the rig was relatively even keel but introduced some significant liabilities when she was inclined, especially to the bow side. Namely, the phenomenon whereby the crew was unable to effectively dewater the rig's four tanks when they desperately wanted to. Choosing to incorporate more evenly dispersed pumping resources into the bow system design may have been another design choice that could have mitigated or even eliminated this unexpected behavior on the night of the incident.
Even if we have zero technical background and no connection to the oil and gas industry, there are several decidedly human lessons that we can all take away from the story of the Ocean Ranger. Hubris is a word that undoubtedly applies to this tragedy. The Ocean Ranger was touted as unsinkable by management, to the point where everyone in the Newfoundland community who had never even laid eyes on her thought of her that way as well. That moniker helped lull her crew into a false sense of security instead of noticing the clear liabilities we just mentioned. Think of the musters during unplanned listing events prior to the actual incident. People showed up in shorts, pajamas, and all forms of clothing not geared for a survival situation because they did not think they were actually in any danger. A good deal of the blame for that false sense of security that was present on board the Ranger rests squarely on the shoulders of leadership. From the time she was still being built in Japan, Otoko boasted about her being unsinkable. Hindsight's 2020, and now this statement clearly seems ridiculous. If maritime history has taught us anything over the years, it's that anything that floats can be sunk under the right circumstances. Let's not forget the morbid irony of another famously unsinkable vessel, the RMS Titanic, which also went down off the coast of Newfoundland just a few hundred kilometers away from the site of the Ocean Ranger. Operating under the assumption that your rig is not unsinkable, taking the time to adequately prepare for emergency situations is paramount. Weekly emergency drills should carry a heightened sense of importance. Critical equipment, such as dry suits, should be available and easy to locate for all crew members when operating in colder parts of the world. Know where these resources are on board your rig and how to get to them quickly. Protect yourself at all times out there. And finally, it should really go without saying that random listing events are unacceptable on any seafaring rig, let alone one that's actively drilling for hydrocarbons. Abnormal conditions like this need to be identified and swiftly dealt with, whether that means additional training for operators or refurbishment of systems to make them simpler to use. At the end of the day, no one person or group can be expected to identify and resolve all potential issues on a rig before they happen. It's a system that's way too big and way too complex for that. Consequently, there's always going to be a certain level of risk that you need to accept, as with all things in life, from flying planes to driving your car to work. But a healthy, team-like culture where the crew places a certain level of importance on being their brother's keeper can go a long way towards making things safer than an adversarial environment can. It was truly sad to read eyewitness accounts of managers like Jimmy Counts declaring that they needed to, quote, go out and save the rig, rather than the men on board, as events were transpiring that cold Monday morning in February. When we do not place much value on the lives of our coworkers and do not think like a team, it can put us all at greater risk. In stark contrast to this, the bravery of the men on board the three support vessels, Seaforth Highlander, Bolton Tor, and Nordator, deserves to be commended. Despite being on smaller ships, with inadequate supplies, and the worst sea conditions that many of them would likely ever see in their careers, these three crews did not hesitate to steam full speed ahead to the ranger's position to render whatever aid they could that morning and after, in many cases, at great risk to their own lives. We'll never know their names. We'll never meet them. And yet, they're the kind of people with the strength of character to rise to the occasion when the time comes to help other strangers who are in need. In the middle of this sad story, these men are an example of some of the highest ideals that we as humans can aspire to. And that point leads us to another key takeaway from this story, the societal impact of the Ocean Ranger tragedy. The loss of the Ocean Ranger drilling rig set off a shockwave in the Newfoundland community in the hours, days, weeks, and years that have followed. Newfoundland was a place that had no prior experience with offshore oil and gas before. They paid the steep price of 56 of their sons as their entrance fee to the game. Although development has since continued and Hibernia has gone on to produce millions of barrels of oil that have undoubtedly made the lives of millions of Canadians better, every February we're reminded that innovation is not free. In the days following the incident, under significant public pressure, the Canadian government set up a royal commission to investigate the incident. Since the vessel was American flagged, the U.S. Coast Guard and National Transportation Safety Board also followed suit. Public hearings were held in Newfoundland, Boston, and New Orleans. A fund was set up 
for the families of the victims, and soon there were a host of lawsuits brought against both Mobile and Otico. A memorial site was established near the coast with the names of the victims written for people to come and pay their respects to. Every year, a memorial service is held in remembrance of the victims. Songs, books, and movies recount the events of what happened that day. But even with all the memorials, remembrances, and literature, it's hard to fully quantify the knock-on effects of parents losing sons, wives losing husbands, and kids losing dads. Now we come full circle. We saw in episode 4 that the Otico Ocean Express had gaps in operating procedures, lack of crew emergency response training, fractured onboard leadership, and a poor understanding of how to operate their own life capsules. All of these factors played a role in the vessel sinking and contributed to the loss of 13 lives during the incident. Sadly, despite the fact that Otico and the industry had six full years to learn from the lessons that came out of the Ocean Express disaster and make operations safer, strikingly similar root causes were uncovered during the Ocean Ranger incident investigation. Thanks to a contentious leadership situation on board, a false sense of security that led personnel to overestimate their preparedness for emergencies, and a lack of understanding of how to properly save or escape the vessel if things did go wrong, this time, 84 men died, and the offshore oil industry was making headlines again for all the wrong reasons. As humans, we really seem to have a hard time following through, especially on a corporate and industry-wide scale. Our memories are short, and we get distracted by the million other things that demand our attention in daily life. Unfortunately, sometimes this leads to gaps, which leads to more mistakes and potentially fatal consequences. So what do we do about it? On an individual level, we can each seek to better control our own environments, to remember the lessons we take away from stories like this, and to use those lessons to inform the actions we take in daily life, whether we're offshore on an oil rig, working in a different industry, or even just in the shop at home. With a little diligent effort, perhaps we can prevent more incidents from happening in the future. Thanks for watching everyone. Initially, we were not going to cover this famous story because of how much content already exists on it out there. But as we got further into the research, we realized that there was more worth covering than just the sequence of events that night. With the 42nd anniversary of the tragedy coming up this February, hopefully it provides some new context and maybe even a little closure to those affected. Two resources that were invaluable to understanding the broader context of this story that we want to call out by name are the books Rig by Mike Heffernan and The Ocean Ranger by Susan Dodd. We read both of these in preparation for making the documentary, and they each captured the human and socioeconomic sides of the tragedy better than any movie, newspaper article, or official incident report ever could. For anyone interested in doing an even deeper dive into all the details that we simply didn't have time to include in this video without making it three hours long, the links to both books are in the description below. We're not affiliated in any way, we just think they're great. In conclusion, by popular demand, we finally made it out of the Gulf of Mexico with this one. In the year to come, we plan to continue the journey around the globe. As for exactly which countries we'll find ourselves in next, that's for y'all to speculate and request in the comments. We'll read them. This year we'll be busy with real life work in addition to making these documentaries, but we're going to do our best to keep a regular upload schedule of high quality content regardless. Until next time, enjoy this one and take care.